I will introduce myself so you know why I'm going to be talking about this particular shipwreck. The Griffin. Um, just uh, very briefly, I assume that you um, that you all know a little bit about shipwrecks. You're uh, living in Harbor Springs area potentially or somewhere near the lakes. And many of you know that the Great Lakes are filled with shipwrecks. These are graphic maps. Um, uh, for anybody who searches for shipwrecks, these wrecks are not quite as close to each other as these graphic representations suggest. But in all the Great Lakes, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,000 to 8,000 shipwrecks. Um, many of those have grounded near shore over the years, but quite a few of them are still out there in deep water. And I think for anybody who just knows a bit about shipwrecks, you've heard about the Griffin, and you've certainly heard about the Edmund Fitzgerald. Um, and, and what's interesting to consider, those I, I would say are the two most famous shipwrecks and uh, they happened, the incidents happened about 300 years apart. The Griffin represents the first shipwreck on the upper Great Lakes and the Edmund Fitzgerald represents pretty much the most recent major disaster and that happened on Lake Superior and it happened in many of our lifetimes. So we know we were around, we heard the news when that happened. But tonight we're gonna focus on the Griffin. Um, and, and you'll see this uh, painting at several places in the program tonight. I wanna note that um, it's, it's a painting done by a maritime artist, probably the most pro prolific um, artist still with us, Bob McGreevy. Uh, some of you might have seen this book where he has a series of beautiful paintings and he shared this uh, with me to uh, help tell this story. Um, and why am I telling this story? Um, well, I've, I've had a little history uh, diving on shipwrecks. I started scuba diving when I was 16 years old. So here I am as a teen um, learning to dive. And uh, as I was doing that, I was also pursuing a professional career. I uh, studied architecture in um, college and uh, worked in that field for a number of years. Um, and while working in the ar architectural profession, I met a group of people in Chicago. We were all divers. We were interested in history. And we got together and formed the Underwater Archaeological Society of Chicago. And it was always tough for me because I was either doing archaeology or architecture. So I had to kind of keep my A's straight. But uh, it was fun to have a sideline, uh, kind of an avocation of doing underwater archaeology um, to my professional career. And uh, uh, it really, really kept me busy in those early years in Chicago. Uh, with the Underwater Archaeological Society, I led a number of projects. And, and I was a bit, um, I had unique qualifications for doing that because I used my design skills, my architectural drawing skills to create site maps for a lot of the shipwrecks that we were documenting. Um, the waters off Chicago are filled with a variety of ship types because that was such a busy harbor for so many years. So I was really starting to combine my passion and my profession. And I also um, started designing uh, on the side museum exhibits. And this is one that I did for the Chicago Maritime Society back in the uh, early 1990s. And on a particular project that I was doing with the society, I met this other diver. I don't know if you can tell man from woman um, in this underwater picture, but uh, the man that I met on a project, I ended up marrying him. He was from Michigan, Jack Van Heest. And where do all good divers get married but underwater? So um, my marriage to Jack uh, got me not only a new diving partner, but um, also a, a, a partner who would be involved in um, studying shipwrecks and pursuing um, shipwrecks. And so when I moved from Chicago, to uh, West Michigan, um, Jack and I met 
several other people that were interested in shipwrecks and uh, research, and we formed the Michigan Shipwreck Research Association. So at that point, I had been um, involved in archaeology uh, for about a dozen years when we started that organization. Um, when I moved from Chicago, I, I think maybe you can see my cursor on the screen. When I moved from Chicago over to West Michigan, there weren't many shipwrecks that had already been found. And yet we knew from our research that there would be many dozens of shipwrecks that had met their end off the shores of West Michigan. And we began a, a methodical a series of expeditions using side scan sonar to hunt for shipwrecks after doing the research. And boy, we've been pretty successful. Um, over the last 20 years, uh, you see the ship names listed in red and blue on various different expeditions. We found 20 shipwrecks. You see six drawings that we put together of how those ships rest on the bottom and uh, some very, very significant discoveries that we've made. So I say all this just to um, share that uh, over the years I've built some credentials doing all this. I, um, I also uh, was encouraged by Michigan State archaeologist to write my first book in 2008 and I've, uh, I've gotten these six books under my belt now um, all on maritime topics. I've also tackled a couple of books that are non-maritime but we're not going to talk about that here tonight. All maritime all the time. Um, and I also formed with a partner, uh, William Lafferty, we formed an exhibit design firm um, featuring, well, focusing on maritime museums. We work at the Port of Ludington Maritime Museum, the um, Southwest, uh, well, the South, the, excuse me, the Michigan Maritime Museum in South Haven. And we're also doing some work with the Chicago Maritime Society uh, in, in Chicago. So uh, done a lot of work that way. And um, along the way, I've been invited to appear on a number of reality television shows. Um, and, and I'm going to say reality if you see me using my air quotes here, um, because, well, we'll learn that um, not all reality television shows are real, but I have had the opportunity to um, learn a bit about how these shows are put together. And um, well, that's my, uh, that's my Hollywood portfolio for you. Um, I think I might have appeared for three to five minutes in all of these. So big career there. Um, but it was probably because of uh, my participation in those other uh, television programs that I got a call. Um, this would be in uh, 2018 from producers at Expedition Unknown. And uh, they wanted to know basically, have I ever heard of the Griffin? Well, of course I've heard about the Griffin. Any good diver, any uh, historian, um, anybody who's been around the Great Lakes for a while has heard of the Griffin. Um, and and uh, I'm going to assume that many of you, I can't ask you if I'm not there in person, I can't ask for a show of hands, but um, I'm going to assume a number of you know a few things about it. But let me share kind of the basic history in, a, in as simple a, a way as I can so that we can understand what is so special about the Griffin. So we start in the 15, well, actually the 1400s, uh, when we all know because of that rhyme, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and he crossed uh, the ocean looking for a route to China, and oops, he bumped into a body of land. And he initially thought that this was indeed China and that he had found the route, and I believe he went to his grave thinking that, in fact, he had found um, the route to China. But a, uh, a, an explorer that followed him, uh, Americo Vespucci, uh, he doubted that Columbus had actually found a route to China. He thought that, in fact, uh, Columbus had found a new world. And uh, what is 
fascinating about this map, this map dates to the early 1500s. And um, I love looking at this because we've got, a, a, they had back then a pretty good understanding of India and of Asia and of Europe and of South, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Africa. But their vision of the new world was this skinny little strip of land that we now know is North America and South America and the Caribbean islands. So um, imagine yourself an explorer who, um, you know, just has no idea the vastness of what you've actually discovered. Well, with the discovery of what people began to understand in the 1500s was a new world, um, Europeans wanted to exploit the resources and the French came over and the English and the Spanish and the Portuguese and, and um, largely it was the French that made inroads into um, North America and what we know today as Canada. And this is another fascinating map um, dating to the early 1600s when the French had started to come into North America. And I think you can all recognize the um, uh, Bay of St. Lawrence, what we know as the St. Lawrence Seaway today, coming into what we know uh, is Lake Ontario. And then beyond that, we can see that the French didn't really have a good handle what was on the interior of this vast new world. But this map is interesting because it points out resources like great farming land in the Midwest and in Canada. It points out a lot of fish species in the Atlantic Ocean. It points out um, the agricultural um, vegetables and harvesting. And, and the, it's hard to see here, but it points out a little critter who's gonna be very, very important to the French. Um, and that critter is the beaver. And it's kind of funny to think about um, the founding of North America largely because of this little critter. And he was important because the Europeans, uh, the French in particular, uh, were very conscious of fashion and they had to have these beaver pelt um, top hats. And uh, they, created so many of these in France that they had really decimated the beaver population. So when they learned that North America had uh, an abundance of beaver and other furry uh, mammals, they uh, really wanted to take advantage of that. So um, there began with the French and, and with the English to some extent, um, the idea of trapping these beavers, skinning them, sending their pelts back to uh, Europe, but they realized that the natives that were already here were much better um, trappers. And so they began a, a methodical program of trading with uh, the local natives. Um, and that was the fur trade industry. And um, one of the early explorers, you'll recognize the name um, Louis Joliet, uh, who came into the Great Lakes region and actually made it over to um, what we know as Lake Michigan today. He was uh, coming into the lakes region. Um, he actually, if you can follow my cursor, he, uh, he was in the Green Bay area and he found a uh, small river that would connect him to the Mississippi. But when he uh, was going to return, um, to announce that he had found a route to the Mississippi, the natives directed him on a different river and he found what we know as uh, Chicago today. He found the route connecting what became Chicago to the Mississippi. Well, he'd made some great inroads to um, exploration, but following him uh, was Robert Sir de La Salle, another Frenchman, who um, was stymied by the fact that there was a, a muddy marsh uh, near what became Chicago that wouldn't allow uh, larger ships. Uh, Louis Joliet did all of his traveling with paddled, paddled canoes. Um, 
Robert Sergio Sal wanted to explore with um, ships like he sailed over from France to uh, the North American continent. And so he needed to find a different route to the Mississippi. So he had a plan, a very ambitious plan, as you'll see. Um, he started out at Fort Frontenac, which is where the um, St. Lawrence Seaway meets Lake Ontario, that's Kingston, Ontario today. And um, he built a, a ship called the Frontenac, named after his fort there. And he intended to use the Frontenac to sail the length of Lake Ontario um, so that he could begin um, explorations into the region, but also trade furs. He was a fur trader because that was the only way to raise money for his explorations. So um, he, his plan was to sail a more modern European fully rigged sailing vessel through all of the Great Lakes. And then his plan was not to take the route um, that was from where we consider Chicago today. He wanted to find what he hoped would be a more direct route that he could sail on to the Mississippi. But there was gonna be a little problem along the way. Um, I think some of you recognize what that problem is right there at what we know as Buffalo today. The problem is this little bitty waterfall um, that was not going to allow him to sail his big fully rigged sailing ship. So um, he, had, uh, he had a plan um, and uh, that plan involved a crew of people. This is Robert um, Sir de La Salle on your left. Um, he brought with him Father Hennepin. Uh, most of the early explorers brought with them uh, a, 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 a priest because while they were trading furs and exploring, they were also trying to convert the native population. Um, a member, a key member of his crew was a man named Tanti. Tanti was known for his iron hand. He had lost one of his hands and was fitted with a hook. And he used that hook to keep the crew um, uh, in line. He was sort of the master to keep the crew in line. But one other important person in this expedition was gonna be a person we don't know a lot about. Um, all we know is his name was Lucas. We don't know what country he was from. We don't know anything about him except that he was going to be the pilot for the Frontenac, the ship that was gonna sail from the head of Lake Ontario to the Niagara, uh, Niagara Falls region. Um, so he'll become a little bit important later on. Now, we know a lot about um, LaSalle's expedition because Father Hennepin kept um, a, a, a very good diary of everything that was going on, almost a day-by-day -day diary. Um, originally, it was written in French. It's been translated. You're seeing a translated version from the uh, early 1700s here. And so we know a lot about that voyage. And so we know that um, they sailed the Frontenac um, to the Niagara region, but they had a little problem. Um, we call uh, uh, the Griffin, we call it the first shipwreck on the, great, on the upper Great Lakes, but really what happened is the Frontenac had an accident just um, a few miles from the Niagara River. Uh, LaSalle had told um, his pilot, Lucas, uh, told Lucas to keep the ship manned when they were um, anchoring at night so that they could, you know, make sure nothing went awry. But uh, Lucas decided to go to shore. It was more comfortable to sleep on shore. And oops, overnight, a storm um, developed and the Frontenac came ashore, was completely totaled in modern uh, language. And the Frontenac was carrying um, everything that they needed to build another ship that their intent was to build on the other side of Niagara Falls. So these uh, very resourceful explorers 
loaded all of the construction materials for the other ship into their canoes and they uh, took those canoes uh, on a portage around the falls to the opposite side of Niagara Falls. Um, and of course the natives watched all this going on and uh, they were able to bring all of the crew, their canoes, all of their shipbuilding equipment around the falls. And uh, they set up a camp on the other side. Now keep in mind, these, th this is all simply forested land. There's no homes, there's natives living in their, um, in their habitats, but uh, this is all complete and total, total wilderness. So they built a camp they built shelters for themselves and they started constructing a second ship. And they decided to name that ship Griffin. Uh, they decided to, uh, history tells us that they might have carved a figurehead of a Griffin. We don't know that for a fact. Uh, we think it might be true. And uh, over the winter, this is 1678. And over the winter, they constructed um, the ship and were able to launch it in the spring of uh, 1679. They still had not fully rigged it. Um, of course, this was a phenomenon for the na natives to see this massive shipping built when all they used were um, canoes. But over the summer of 1679, they rigged the ship and uh, in September, they set sail to continue their explorations. And at this point, using the newly um, christened Griffin, they sailed through the Great Lakes and to what we know as the Green Bay area today, um, Wisconsin, uh, you might know it as Door County region uh, across uh, the lake from Harbor Springs. And, uh, there, they picked up furs that they, the crew had traded with the natives there. And, and uh, we understand from Father Hennepin's writings that the, the furs filled the griffin. Well, trading furs was not LaSalle's main mission. Um, his main mission was to continue on um, south on Lake Michigan and find that uh, other alternative route to the Mississippi. So um, what uh, LaSalle wanted um, his crew to do is sail the Griffin back to um, the uh, Lake Ontario region and sell those furs and uh, uh, gain money for that. Of course, they had to switch vessels uh, at Niagara Falls, but he wanted them to sell those furs um, and then while they are returning to collect money and to also collect more uh, materials for building yet another ship, uh, LaSalle would take the rest of the crew, sail south on Lake Michigan to the, uh, what he knew would be the Miami River outlet, in, inlet. Um, we call that the St. Joseph River today. But uh, at that place, um, LaSalle intended to build another ship. Um, and so we know that uh, LaSalle then ordered the crew on the Griffin to sell those furs and then return and meet up in a couple of months at, um, uh, at the uh, Miami River. And then they would continue on um, with their explorations. Well, the best laid plans don't always work out. Um, LaSalle took the majority of his crew, he headed south paddling canoes uh, down the length of Lake Michigan. And he set, uh, sent the five members of his crew plus um, uh, uh, Lucas, his pilot, he sent them back on the Griffin. So we've got six people on the Griffin. They split up at the region of Door County as we know it today. And uh, it wasn't but a day of paddling uh, south that LaSalle encountered a huge storm. Um, he ended up making it through the storm, but of course he had a bit of concern for the Griffin. The Griffin would have encountered that same storm. 
but I imagine that if he made it in a series of small canoes, he probably assumed that the Griffin had indeed made it. So um, by uh, November, uh, LaSalle and the majority of his crew were fully ensconced south at the south end of Lake Michigan. They had started building what they called Fort Miami and uh, they waited out the, the winter they waited into the spring and the griffin never returned to them. So now at this point, LaSalle has no idea what happened to the griffin. And you know what he does? This is absolutely crazy. He's in uh, what we know as Benton Harbor, Michigan today. And he decides to walk to what we know as Kingston, Ontario today. Walk through the wilderness by himself uh, I had to do the uh, math on, um, on uh, MapQuest to find out that that was about a 500 mile walk that he did. And when he got to uh, what we know as Kingston today, he learned that the Griffin never returned. And so now he needed to find out what happened to the Griffin. So he um, got back on canoes, with um, uh, some new recruits from Fort Frontenac. And he made his way, he followed what should have been the route of the Griffin, stopping along the way to inquire of the natives, to inquire of the fort um, at, that had been established at Mackinac to see if anybody had heard anything about what happened to the Griffin. And along the way, he heard three different theories. Um, one of the theories came from some other fur traders who said that they were pretty sure that they had seen the six member crew of the Griffin. Um, and, and that person believed that they had burned the Griffin, stolen the furs, uh, set out to sell those furs and make their own money. And, um, and so basically mutiny. Um, now, if that were the case, the griffin would no longer exist in physical form. Um, other theories were that the crew not really understanding the waterways, uh, that they met with a mishap, they grounded somewhere on shore, um, the ship was maybe broken up, uh, the crew might have lived, the crew might have died. But in that case, maybe the ship, excuse me, uh, went backwards here, maybe the ship, um, would have uh, still been visible. It might be a shipwreck in shallow water. So that was the second theory. And the third theory was that that storm was so brutal that it took the griffin down. And if that were the case, the griffin would be somewhere in deep water, um, a shipwreck that maybe would be found somewhere in the future. Well, so that's the basic story. It's a long, it's a complex story of why the Griffin was sailing and how it disappeared. Um, and so when Expedition Unknown, um, you know, pursued the idea of doing an episode about the Griffin, they asked me, are there any plans to search for the Griffin? And if any of you have watched the show, you know, it always involves uh, an expedition to find something that's lost. Uh, when they asked me if I had any plans, I kind of laughed um, because the Griffin, well, you know, if you believe what you've he heard over the years in the news, well, the Griffin's been found. Um, the first uh, discovery of the Griffin was in the neighborhood of where it was built. But over the next 200 years, the Griffin's been found no less than 20 times in all these various places where you see the red dots. And uh, so we always laugh that it's, uh, it, it's the first ship lost on the upper Great Lakes and it's the ship that's been found the most. Now, let me share with you as I did with the producers at Expedition Unknown, let me share with you three of those discoveries. A real early one was 19, uh, in the 1960s where a man was absolutely sure that this wreckage that you see in the picture, this was in Georgian Bay, he was absolutely sure that it was a griffin and it was announced in the newspapers. And uh, he was so sure that over his lifetime, um, he considered himself the finder of the griffin. And when he died, 
his family engraved on his tombstone that he is the discoverer of LaSalle's Griffin. Well, after he died, a team of archeological students surveyed that wreckage and they determined that it was in fact the remains of a Mackinac sailing boat. Those are little sailing boats like you see in this image. And so that man, his name was Ori Vale, he did not find the griffin. So that was proven. Many of you will know that Steve Leibert, who's actually from Charlevoix, about um, 10 years ago announced that he had found the griffin. Um, if you Google uh, right now, if you Google, you will see uh, many things online that says Steve Leibert found the griffin. This is what Steve Leibert found. Um, he found this in the region of Door County. It was sort of in the right neighborhood. That's, that's where the griffin took off from. But what he found was this stick. It's about 20 feet long. It's kind of rectilinear. It's got some posts sticking out of it. And he was absolutely sure that that was the bowsprit of the griffin. Now, um, it was just sticking out of the lake bottom and he was sure that the griffin was buried in the sand beneath this bowsprit. Uh, now let's talk about bowsprits. Um, this is a, a re replica sailing craft and this is the bowsprit. It's a tubular device uh, or cylindrical device, I should say. And I don't see any little posts sticking out of it. Um, so it does, doesn't really look like that um, piece of timber that he found in, in, uh, on the lake bottom. Uh, but Steve Leibert was very persistent and he, I must, uh, uh, you know, admire him for doing things the right way. He couldn't just excavate to look for the griffin. He act actually had to get a permit from the authorities to be able to scour out the bottom of Lake Michigan. Getting that permit took him about um, four years of bureaucratic um, uh, uh, you know, letter writing campaign back and forth, but he finally got an official permit. He hired a crew of people, they began the excavation and they found nothing buried in the lake bottom. So. Uh, he was persistent. His permit allowed him to recover that timber. He had it analyzed. He had it carbon dated. Um, and indeed, it was about 300 years old. But the trouble with trying to carbon date wood is that the tree that made whatever this is could certainly have been 300 years old. But that doesn't make this object 300 years old. Now, what most of us realize, and and Certainly, I was not the one to come up with this. Um, plenty of historians realized that what he had found was something called a pound net stake. Um, you see it as a fishing configuration. The Native Americans used this um, to uh, devise a, a, a netting that would trap fish. And so most people are convinced that Steve Leibert found a pound net stake. He did not find the griffin. So we, we really think we've put that to rest. But most recently, within the last four years, uh, this man pictured here, uh, Kevin Dykstra, also announced that he had found the griffin. He announced that he found it off Frankfurt, Michigan, which is pretty unusual because those French explorers would have been heading south instead of east if the griffin went down off Frankfurt. But let's, uh, let's not let that get in the way. This is what he found. Um, it's it's a part of a shipwreck. It's covered with zebra mussels. He was sure that the head, griffin, the carved head of the griffin was somewhere under these zebra mussels. Um, what was more interesting about his discovery is he claimed to have found it while searching for Civil War gold lost off a car ferry off Frankfurt. Well, nobody had ever heard of that happening before, um, but it certainly made headlines so much so that Michigan's state archeologist, um, Wayne Lasardi here came to survey what Kevin Dykstra had found. And uh, as soon as he went down, he saw a big immense boiler um, on, the shipwreck, so certainly it could not have been the 300-year-old griffin. So 
the griffin was not found, but what we understand is that Kevin Dykstra certainly knew that he had not found the griffin, but um, he did get a lot of media attention for that discovery. And you know what it netted him? His own reality television show, A Curse of the Civil War Gold. I hope none of you have watched this. There's not a bit of truth to it. I won't, um, I won't go on. Um, to say anything more about that, but uh, suffice it to say, it's not true. Now, Expedition Unknown, um, they, uh, they knew a bit about these other discoveries and, and I had shared uh, these other discovery stories, but I was really not interested in participating with them on anything if they were going to um, talk about these other false discoveries. Um, but they liked the idea of actually hunting for the griffin. So they asked me where I would search for the griffin. And uh, of course, if the story of the mutiny was true, it wouldn't still be out there. But um, I really considered uh, the idea that it could still be out there. We know that the griffin left the Door County region. We know it was heading through the Straits of Mackinac. And so we might consider that it would have been lost in this upper area of Lake Michigan or upper Lake Huron because um, they were probably in this region when that storm happened. So um, I let the producers know about a couple of historians, probably uh, uh, more recognized Griffin historians that, than me, um, Chris Cole and Joan Forsberg, uh, pictured here, wrote the book about the griffin, and they embraced one theory. They embraced the theory that the griffin grounded near shore. And uh, in fact, um, they felt that it had already been found. Um, in the 1930s, where you see the red asterisks here uh, along the uh, shores of Manitoulin Island, that's a Canadian island that separates uh, Lake Huron from Georgian Bay, um, a wreck had been seen on shore in the 1930s. You see a piece of it here. And Chris and Joan um, thought that that may well be the griffin. It was found in the Straits of Mississauga along shore near what is a lighthouse up there. Um, it had first been uh, looked at in the 1930s by uh, this man here. Um, uh, his name is Harry Tucker. Um, he also was followed by a man named Roy Fleming, um, who really were very convinced that this was the griffin. Um, they uh, took these pictures. So these pictures date to the late 20s, the early 1930s. And um, you can see these large timbers. You can see these iron bolts. Um, they also shared a story, sort of a story in hindsight, that somewhere near this wreck, uh, the former lighthouse keeper on the island had stumbled upon a couple of caves. And in those two caves near the wreck site, um, they found six skeletons. And one of the skeletons had a really big head. And so Harry Tucker, talk to the media about how pilot Lucas of the Griffin had was, was a giant. He was seven feet tall, he had a huge head. And so Harry Tucker was really very sure that the, that was the wreck of the Griffin and that the crew came ashore and the crew found shelter in these caves and the crew ultimately died. And so he kind of combined the story of the cave and the skeleton discovery with the story of the wreck. And, uh, and, and he was sure that this was the skull of Lucas, the pilot who he said was a giant. Well, he went to the media and this is a, a much longer story than I can, can share with you tonight, but there are dozens and dozens of articles from the 1930s that talk about the wreckage being confirmed as the Griffin. Um, and so we've got three discoveries here um, that, um, it, you know, could possibly be the Griffin. Now, 
I put the expedition unknown folks also in touch with this man, Brendan Baylod, who had done a lot of research on the Griffin. And he was of the mind that the Griffin is still out there somewhere on the bottom, probably of Lake Michigan. And he had done quite a bit of work analyzing the writings of Hennepin. He'd created these search grids. They're all very um, technical, but he basically believed that the Griffin was going to be found in northern Lake Michigan. Um, and he followed um, one of the accounts where some natives reported seeing the Griffin heading out in a storm and saw the storm swallow the Griffin. So there was some historical basis for him, his theory. So I put Expedition Unknown in touch with these three um, historians who I thought would probably be able to provide um, a, a good team to go hunting for the Griffin in two different places. And uh, thinking that I had gotten myself out of participating, um, that was not the case because they said, oh, we want you along on the expedition as well. So all of a sudden I'm a member of the team um, when, when I was trying to uh, involve these other people. So here we were, all four of us invited to participate with Josh Gates, um, the star of this program. Um, I hope some of you have seen the show, just a little bit uh, about Josh Gates. He's kind of the real deal. He went to school for archeology. span um, He really knows what he's talking about. He's also a scuba diver. He's a mountain climber. Um, he, this show tackles real life mysteries. Um, you know, Amelia Earhart is just one of the many topics he's covered. What I have come to understand is that while he presents the shows as if um, he is joining explorers on their expeditions, um, it's really the production team that's putting together the expeditions, but they are involving, like this woman here who's an archeologist he teamed up with, they are involving individuals who are the experts and who have been involved in real life expeditions. So there is, a good deal of reality based in this particular show. Now, what I kind of love about the show is they always do a historical reenactment. I like reenactments because they they uh, help us, uh, you know, put ourselves in the frame of mind of of the time period of which the exploration is being done. So that's part of the show. And um, for any of you who have watched the show. Josh has a lot of fun um, doing what he does. There's always something um, uh, daring and silly uh, about the shows and uh, he, he truly is a, a really neat guy. So here it was that I was invited to participate in uh, what would be a, an expedition crafted by the producers. Well, they wanted me up on Manitoulin Island to meet up with Chris Cole and really explore the concept that the Griffin had already come to shore and uh, was the wreckage up there. Now I had to really familiarize myself with this story. Um, what I learned was that that wreck no longer exists on shore. Pieces of it are in a museum up there in a couple different museums. So really um, all I had to look at were these photographs from the 1930s. And as I started studying these and talking to experts, the thing that stood out is look at all these iron bolts. Um, did the French construct ships in the 1600s in the wilderness of um, what we now know as upstate New York, did they construct the ship with iron? Um, so these bolts were really very key to trying to understand it. Now, I knew that very, very old ships are constructed with fasteners, wooden fasteners called tree nails. And uh, here is a, a drawing of a tree nail. And, and it struck me that building a ship in the wilderness that the contractors doing this would probably have made fasteners right from the trees in the woods. But I'm no expert on this. I turned to uh, this this fellow who wrote um, a book about ship's fasteners. And what I learned from him is that certainly while um, 
the ability to make iron and the ability to make bolts and screws was an ancient um, uh, 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 industry. Um, in studying ship construction, uh, the author uh, really didn't feel that bolts were used until uh, about the 1840s, 1850s. So we had an authority on fasteners say that he didn't really think that the uh, griffin would have been made with iron fasteners. And what's even more um, telling is that um, LaSalle had another ship built called the LaBelle that he used in a later exploration. That ended up sinking off the coast of Texas. And in recent times, it has been uh, raised. It has been preserved. It's now displayed in a museum. And I talked to the woman here, Tony Carroll, who had been the lead archaeologist on this. And she indicated that there were very few um, iron fasteners on the LaBelle, which had in fact been built in a French shipyard, not in the wilderness. So I really started to doubt these iron fasteners. And you know, I started to doubt this story of the cave um, because that cave was after all just hearsay. None of the skeletons still existed. And I turned to a man who like me um, was concerned that Pilot Lucas, there's really nothing official to tell us that he was a giant. And certainly in the 1600s, if someone was seven feet tall, that would be an anomaly. People were smaller back then. So this fellow, Joe Kelman, he wrote a, basically a thesis proving that Lucas was no giant. Um, and in fact, um, he found some uh, writings from Hennepin that indicated uh, the only description of Lucas said he had short legs. So we began to doubt, um, I began to doubt this whole story about the cave. So by the time that I got up to Manitoulin Island in the uh, uh, late summer of 2018, I didn't believe that that wreck up there was going to be the Griffin. Uh, we did some filming over a three-day period up there. That's Chris Cole and I with Josh Gates. We filmed in the museum. We looked at some of the recovered pieces from that wreckage. Uh, you can see them here. Uh, not a lot of them have been well documented. Some of them were recovered later by divers. Um, it's, it's not very well taken care of, but it was certainly a good backdrop to talk about the history of the Griffin and the history of this particular discovery. So you can see some of the stills I shot. Uh, now, of course, um, there has to be some fun exploration. So we got on ATVs, we traveled through the woods, we went to the shoreline uh, where the supposed wreck of the Griffin had come ashore. Of course, it's no longer there. Um, we also, uh, from there went to the nearby cave, which uh, is not frankly the cave that was originally found. It's just a cave that the producers scouted in the area. Um, but you know, it's all part of the telling the story. So um, we also, while up there filming, we had an opportunity to meet Robert Sir de La Salle himself, an actor who was an extra in this program. And uh, let me see here, uh, I met Father Hennepin, how about that? And I also met some of the uh, natives that were uh, appearing in the reenactment. So these are all uh, individuals that were hired by the, construct uh, the uh, production crew. So it was a very fun three-day shoot up there. Um, of course, we moved on to the water because we're going to go out and look for um, the, the remains of the ship that might have over the years from 1930 to today might still be out there um, uh, on the bottom of the strait. So there was some discussion about diving. I was gonna be diving with Josh. So we had to get our gear together, um, head out on the boat, uh, gear up. And uh, they had me uh, wear a full face mask so that Josh and I could talk to each other underwater for the filming. So this was all very 
very fun. Um, and ultimately, about six months after that filming, um, the uh, episode aired in the uh, the spring of 2019. And at this point, I'm going to I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing. And if you uh, are interested, Beth is going to uh, play a little segment. It's about five minutes of that episode. And uh, you can see what a horrible actress I am. And uh, let's see if Beth can, can get that uh, on the screen. Yeah, I think I will be able to. Give me okay. just one second here. I'll get my box set up. Can all of you see that, I hope? It was an hour long episode. This is just a teeny little part. Okay, I am screen sharing. Valerie, do you see that okay? I see that. Okay, here we go. Potential identity of the Griffin that might hold up. Yes, in fact, it's right here. This is wreckage that washed up on the rocky western shoreline of this island. A lot of photographs were taken of it, a lot of documentation was made, drawings and so on. And these artifacts here are from that wreck as well. Yes. And so if this is the Griffin, how do you think this ship ended up on this beach? I believe that ship was blown through the Straits of Mackinac and being driven onto the rocks at a dangerous place called Magnetic Reef. Magnetic Reef sounds like a place that a ship would wreck. Supposedly, the ship's compasses went awry when they got there because of some iron magnetic uh, anomaly. In the 1890s, the lighthouse keeper, pretty close to where that wreckage lay, stumbled upon a cave in which there were three skeletons, a silver chain, silver watch case, and several French coins from the 1600s. And not too long after that, the lighthouse keeper found three more skeletons. And that brings the total number of skeletons to six, which is the total number of people on the Griffin. Right. OK, now we're talking. We've got six bodies. We've got French artifacts. We've got wreckage from the right time period. Why isn't this an open and shut case then? Well, the trouble with that is nothing remains today as primary evidence of those discoveries. The skeletons, the artifacts. It's all now hearsay. The wreckage that was on shore was swept away in 1940. The lighthouse burned. The skeletons were lost. That is a problem. What little survived is here in this museum. And while these artifacts may have come from a ship of the same time period, there's nothing that conclusively ties them to the Griffin. So what would it take to prove this is the Griffin? Something indisputable, such as finding one of the cannons that was known to have been on board. If we could find some left behind artifacts, that could be the proof. Well, let's go find it. <laughs> So we hop on ATVs and Chris leads us to our starting point in the search for the cave that may be hiding relics from the Griffin. Oh, oh, we approach the densely forested edge of the island and walk the rest of the way to the beach where the mysterious wreckage washed ashore and, centuries later, was swept away. Today, all that's left to mark the location is a crudely painted letter G. Here it is. Chris found the G spot. I, it's, it's a mandatory joke. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's OK. Where is this cave where the lighthouse keeper supposedly found these skeletons and artifacts? Supposed to be not too far away from the G spot, somewhere just in here. Well, why don't we see if we can find that? Maybe we get lucky. Imagine shipwreck survivors trying to make their way up here to find shelter. <gasps> We scour the thick forest surrounding the beach, looking for any traces of a cave. I see something up here. What do you got? Oh my God, look at that. This is awesome. This really could be the place where these sailors took shelter. And we're perhaps standing in the grave of these sailors. Big part of what Chris and I do is to help find closure to these stories. And that's one of the reasons that looking for the Griffin is so important. These weren't just ships, these were lives of people. You think of a lake, you think of 
glassy water, something contained. I mean, this is like looking out into the ocean. Well, there's a reason the Griffin's down there. The water in the Great Lakes can get more treacherous than any area in the ocean. And this boat is about half the size of the Griffin. That's encouraging. That's it. <laughs> Way to put it in perspective, though. We reach the strait, and our little boat struggles in the choppy water. In stormy weather, it's entirely possible that the Griffin could have been driven into a well-hidden reef. The sonar unit sends out pulses of sound waves called pings, and then listens for the echo to measure distance and to build a picture of whatever lies in the depths. Okay, we got a target there. Zoom in on this. What is this? Straight line. And there's shadow. There's some height there. That could be that thing, yes? Possibly straight enough. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't look natural. It doesn't look like a rock. But right on the edge of the reef, that could be the beginning of a debris field. Absolutely. Want to get wet? Let's do it. This vessel is massive, more than a hundred feet. So large, it can't possibly be part of the same wreck. The construction looks totally different. They look like two different ships. Absolutely unbelievable. Oh, incredible. Not one shipwreck, but two. One seems to be a schooner, uh -huh. and the other with the machinery might have been a steamship. Yeah. Once I saw the machinery of the second ship, it was over. Definitely not old enough to be the Griffin. It has the characteristics of the mid to late 1800s. Wow. So, what do you think, Chris? Well, we know there were at least four wrecks here at Magnetic Reef in the late 1800s, early 1900s. But those ships have not been officially identified out here? No, they haven't. Wow. New discovery, Josh. New discovery. Really cool. Awesome. Great work. Hey, nice work, man. Great. That was yeah. great. So let me conclude this story and uh, mention a few things about that little clip that you saw. Um, next time you're watching this show or any reality show, um, consider that an expedition filmed for television is first and foremost a television show before it's an expedition. Um, What's great about the folks at Expedition Unknown and Josh is that they actually had us up there for one solid day, running side scan equipment, actually looking for the remains of the Griffin. And there was certainly a chance that we might have found, um, the, you know, that, that piece of wreckage that had fallen back in the water. Um, but in fact, we had something in our hip pockets. Chris Cole had found those two shipwrecks the year prior. He had never announced that publicly. Um, so we had a hip pocket discovery because something is always found on Expedition Unknown. It, it's usually not what they're looking for. But it was a great way to frame the actual Griffin story. Um, I think they did a great job. Um, you know, certainly um, uh, people have looked for the Griffin for 300 years. It's not going to be found while filming for television. So where is the Griffin? Well, if you watch that entire episode, you will see that after um, uh, they uh, worked with us in uh, northern Lake Huron, um, they went to northern Lake Michigan and they met with Brendan Baylod. And they did do some searching up there using a submarine. Um, it looks great on the uh, show. The submarine is great, but they almost died filming that episode. I can tell that in, in private quarters. I can tell that story later. But um, at, at any rate, of course, they did not find the Griffin up there in their one day of searching. They did find another shipwreck that uh, had been found prior to that by Brendan and uh, Jim Kennard, and that is the shipwreck that you will see on this episode. But what is great about 
this episode bringing Brendan and bringing Chris and Joan and I um, to television um, and telling this story is that now there is a renewed interest to actually look for the Griffin. Um, Brendan is, um, has been for the last summer and will be this summer up in Northern Lake Michigan, continuing the hunt for the Griffin. So we um, look forward to the potential of an actual discovery um, in, in the future. And, and what's interesting when we look back at, you're, you're just seeing four of the people here among the 20 some people that were absolutely convinced that they had found the Griffin. You know, what we're seeing is that people are having trouble, you know, differentiating uh, fake from fact. And there's something so alluring for anybody in maritime circles, you know, if you could be the person that found the griffin, you know, you'd go to your grave being famous. Well, let me tell you, it is pretty exciting to find a shipwreck. I have been involved in the discovery about of about 20 shipwrecks. And there's a really uh, a phenomenal feeling to be among the first people to dive on a long lost vessel. But I can tell you that finding a shipwreck does not make you famous. Um, my, my fame is my 15 minutes um, uh, on television, my combined total of 15 minutes. And uh, that has not, um, not in any way lined my pocket. So um, I am grounded in reality, in real history, uh, real mysteries, trying to solve those mysteries. And uh, a, a postscript of um, participating in the Griffin episode working with Josh Gates is while I was up in Canada, I gave Josh one of my books about, um, you know, a true story of a mystery, uh, a, a mystery of an airplane that crashed in Lake Michigan in 1950 is the story of flight 2501. Our team has been looking for it for years. We've not found it, but instead I wrote a book um, largely to give closure to the many families who are still alive that lost someone in this crash. 58 people died. And I guess Josh must have read the book because uh, the very next year he invited me to film another episode. And uh, this was actually a two hour episode based on my book. And of course we went looking for the plane and of course we didn't find it, but it was really a, a very well done episode that very truthfully told this story. And so um, that, that is, that's, that's a, a, a side story. Uh, I hope some of you will consider reading about that or reading one of my other books. And there's my publishers, uh, website if you're interested in the books maybe they're up at the harbor springs library and uh, so with that i will conclude my program ran a little longer than i had hoped but um, i don't know if beth wants to open up the zoom for some questions and we do have some questions in fact sure. um, one of the questions has been asked a couple times and it's my question as well okay. um, the two ships that you did find in that episode uh, wh what were they boy um, i am you're 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 stumping me because those were Chris Chris's discoveries. Um, I, I'm going to forget their names, uh, but it was indeed a um, steamship that was towing a schooner barge, and they encountered a big storm, and they went down together. And so we were diving on the remains of uh, of two shipwrecks that were kind of. Uh, head to head uh, underwater is really quite interesting. Uh, they were lost in the, uh, I believe it was late 1800s. And, and you know, the majority of ships lost on the Great Lakes, uh, the majority of them were lost, I'd say between the 1850s and the 1920s. Um, highest, you know, number of ships out there are schooners because they were less maneuverable, but there were still um, you know, dozens and dozens of, of major steamship disasters that killed people. So, um, yeah, there are there's a lot of history out there on the bottom. And and I always say, you know, there's there's no need to make up stories. We've got so much reality out there that, uh, you know, we, we can't uh, there aren't enough room on the bookshelves to write all those books. So, right. 
Um, let's see, Allison would like to know, um, wouldn't it be important to consider the prevailing wind direction of a storm, assuming that the Griffin sunk in that same storm of LaSalle? You know, that's, that's a really great question. Um, we use the consideration of wind and waves and currents. In fact, if you watch that episode or read the book about um, uh, Fatal Crossing about Flight 2501 that I wrote, we do often look at the winds and the currents. Um, there, there's a whole lot more to the Griffin story. I talked for an hour, I could talk for two hours more, but in, in, the, in the 1680s, when LaSalle was looking for the Griffin, there was a report that some debris came ashore on the um, east side of Mackinac Island. And so for a time, they thought that it in fact sank in Lake Huron. Um, but I've worked with uh, a, a man who does the study of currents up in the Straits. There's been a lot of work up there considering what would happen if the pipeline broke, what would happen, where would the oil go? And so uh, uh, this researcher, David Schwab, um, has studied the currents in the Straits and it's frightening. If that pipeline broke, um, the oil would spill into Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. It would contaminate the whole northern region. So certainly the currents could have brought Griffin debris, debris to any number of places. Very, very strange currents up there. Yeah, I bet. Um, let's see. Lee would like to know uh, if there have been any digs around Tonawanda Creek to look for artifacts? Uh, you know, uh, I, I think sure. that's, I think that's um, over by, um, that's over by where the Griffin was built, isn't it? I'm not sure, that's yeah. a good question. Lee, I don't know if you, know. you wanna unmute anybody, but, um, you know, again, I- He uh, says yes, that is where yes, he's talking about. Yes, exactly. And and I, I can't tell you if there has been, um, there, that one of the early discoveries, uh, supposed discoveries of the Griffin was in that region. Um, and, and certainly it would, be, it would be very exciting to just look for remains of their camp where they built this. Trouble is there's a, um, there's a kid's park at the site today. So if you watch um, the whole episode, you'll see Joan Forsberg being interviewed in that park talking about the Griffin. Right, you'd have to dig up some kid's sand pit to- You would. Oh my, yes. You would. <laughs> um, let's see, another question here. Um, of all the shipwrecks that you personally have found, what's your, what's your favorite? What's your favorite discovery? Oh boy. Um, wow, uh, I think the most significant discovery we have made is a ship called the Hennepin. Um, it went down in 1920, it, it, let's see, 1928 in Lake Michigan off South Haven. And uh, we particularly went looking for it, but we didn't realize until we found it that it was in fact the first self unloading ship. Now, why is that important? Um, because ships were unloaded by manpower for decades and decades and decades. But in 1902, um, an engineering firm devised a um, belt system that ran through the inside of the ship and traveled through buckets to uh, 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 deposit the cargo, bulk cargo on shore. Well, if anybody's around any big marina and you see ships unloading with this boom, those are self unloaders. Self unloaders are. 80% of the ships sailing the Great Lakes today. And we found the prototype on the bottom of Lake Michigan. And until that point, nobody recognized that it was a self unloader. So I wrote the National Register of Historic Places. I wrote the nomination um, and it was listed. It's the only shipwreck in the Michigan waters of Lake Michigan that's on the National Register. And no, you can't go out there and see the nice state sign because there is no state sign underwater. So that's probably our most significant discovery. Was it named after the Hennepin from um, the story? 
it, actually, that's, yeah, I didn't even think about that. No, it, it was named after Hennepin County in Minnesota, which was named after Father Hennepin. Gotcha. Then, but uh, it, it was named because they hoped to get business from Hennepin County, you know, sort of an ordinary reason for uh, naming a ship, making yeah. money. That's what these ships were all about. Is one of your books about that discovery? Um, yeah, actually, my partner, Bill Lafferty, and I, he's my uh, exhibit design partner. We met over the discovery of the Hennepin. Um, he is probably uh, the country's most renowned expert on self unloaders. And so he and I collaborated on the book, Buckets and Belts, The Evolution of Great Lakes Self-Unloaders. Um, I wrote all the parts about the, the self-unloaders that wrecked, and Bill wrote all the technical parts about the self-unloading ship. So we divided and conquered on that one. Wonderful. Uh, let's see, we do have one more question, it looks like. Um, Vivian would like to know if you've dived any of the uh, non-discovered areas in the Mackinac Bridge area? Well, you know, I've dived under Mackinac Bridge. Um, there is a, uh, gosh, there's, well, there's probably a dozen ships that have wrecked because that's really, you know, in terms of shipping, that's really a very narrow passage. It's only five miles wide. And there've been a lot of accidents. Probably the most tragic was the sinking of the Cedarville, uh, a big, I wanna say 700 foot um, ship. Um, it was a self unloader and uh, it overturned. Uh, I wrote about, uh, well, I referenced it. I didn't write about it because it's technically in Lake Huron, but um, I, I, yes, I did write about it in Buckets and Belts because I interviewed a man who was on that ship um, when it overturned, he was one of about half of the crew who lived, but the other half died. And this was, you know, so close to shore. So yes, I have dived in the Straits of Mackinac. Um, I have not done any searching up there. There's still some wrecks to find. All right. It looks like that was actually the last question. You must have answered all the others. Um, so I wanted to say one more time, thank you so much. This is